Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sounds from the Studio, brought to you by Contemporary Craft. Contemporary Craft fosters the use of traditional craft materials such as ceramic, fiber, glass, metal, and wood to make art. Our community honors the history and heritage of craft while showcasing modern, exploratory work. And since our organization is located in Pittsburgh, PA, we decided to bring some of the stories of our exhibiting and studio artists to a broader audience by way of this podcast. I'm Rachel, the Executive Director at Contemporary Craft. And I'm Camila, a podcaster and art enthusiast. We are your hosts for this journey, and there are many ways to keep up with us. You can go to the Facebook page and like it, Contemporary Craft, on Twitter at SCCPGH, Instagram at SCCPGH, or just go to ContemporaryCraft.org. Coming up at Contemporary Craft is a solo exhibition by New Mexico-based artist Brie Rue. This work is spanning eight years and will explore the idea that memory, place, and experience are based on an individual's perception and haptic experience. Made from the artist's body's weight and clay, Bree's work inherently addresses the experience of embodiment. It's movement-based artwork that forges an intimacy with the viewer's experience. The exhibition opens on February 2nd and is going to run through May 4th. I hope you can come and visit us. Adrian, welcome to Sounds from the Studio. Thank you for having me. How are you doing today? I'm okay. Have a little bit of a cold, so that's my throat oh, no. thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's just a cold though, not COVID. No, not COVID. Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> where, where are you joining us from today? I am in Oakland, California. Oh, nice. Is it nice and balmy? <laughs> it's beautiful out. <laughs> We've got some some nice fall weather. You kind of have to pay attention to tell that it's fall, but it's fall. Yeah. Right on. Nice. Adrian, it's nice to be talking with you again. For our listeners uh, that might not know, we currently have your work installed in the gallery as part of the Climate Awakening Exhibition, which is some of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and also, you participated in a residency with us just prior to the opening. So um, are you okay if we start in that vein of questioning? Absolutely. Okay, great. So it happens that I just gave a tour of the exhibition, and of course, everyone was really blown away by the amount of work that you made in such a short amount of time. Uh, can we can we talk about the residency? What was that for you? What did it entail? Absolutely. But first, I should say I didn't make all the work myself because the proposal I had kind of come to you guys with when. Um, the the invitation for the show happened was um, to make new work that's more site specific and responsive to Pittsburgh because I've been feeling like when we talk about climate change as a concept if you don't talk about like regional and like locality um, as part of that conversation then you're missing a big piece of the puzzle Um, And also just the fact that Pittsburgh has this insane history in America as kind of the epicenter of industrialization, um, which is very closely tied to concepts of climate change. So I I didn't want to have a show where I just like make work in California, ship it to you guys, plop it down on a pedestal and be like, that's about climate change. (laughs) When there was like this huge opportunity to respond to the place and that proposal led to this partnership with two local um, artisans, designers, crafters, whatever you want to call them, Um, one of whom I had known previously, uh, a a dear friend named Julian Matarino, who's a glassblower, and then um, the other one who you guys hooked me up with, who you have a relationship with, Dan uh, Brockett, who runs his own farm and grows his own willow and makes baskets, and those guys really like the collective action of all of us working together was how that work happened in three weeks, which I probably wouldn't do again. If <laughs> I, um, it's like, you're glad it, was, it happened, but <laughs> you don't need to revisit that stress. Um, it, it wasn't stressful. It was just packed, I think. Mm. And six weeks might have been a really good amount of time. But sometimes you just don't have, you know, this summer was quite crazy. So um, I'm so, so glad that that happened the way that it did. And I'm really, like, 
pleased with the results of the work, but also what's happened since then, which is really cool stuff. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think from my standpoint, um, you know, we just launched this residency program in the past year, the national residency program. And um, I'm just like so blown away and pleased and impressed in all of the words with what you did with that opportunity um, to be here and spend time here and be in community with people who are making in the region because to me it kind of set the bar for what a residency can be it really showed like you did so much research and you know we can talk about the things that you studied while you were here as well but just like you just totally embraced that opportunity and it was really impressive to see you connect with two people that live here and work here and bring them into the fold and collectively make this an incredible body of work so um just want to acknowledge it's amazing people you should stop in and see it really is amazing and i really appreciate just like how much you embraced the opportunity so rachel's um, like a proud mama (laughs) (laughs) which just feels really good you know because it's like you didn't just come here and make work in a silo you you really did do what you're saying like you explored um so for that exploration you looked at the rivers a bit and you went on some tours can you tell us about that yeah wow the rivers um the yeah the allegheny was the main one i kind of focused on and it's it's um Residencies are so interesting because oftentimes you propose what you're going to do like a year in advance in some cases, and you've maybe never been to the place that you're going and don't know who's there or what really could happen. So it's kind of this like you're trying to do research from a computer somewhere far (laughs) away. And um, I was able to make enough connections through just initially reaching out to different agencies that do work on the river. Um, to set up those tours to kind of get the ball rolling. And then once I got there, I had the first week I kind of set aside to do all of those kind of field trips. So I drove up to Warren, which is kind of at the, not the exact headwaters of the Allegheny. It's about three hours from Pittsburgh. Um, And also pretty close to where um, the first kind of oil gas exploration started. Um, so like as a place that just felt really significant for me to, to, to visit. And then also um, the connection I made with the wild, US Wildlife Fish, Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm forgetting the total. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they were so kind. They, um, I just kind of blanket emailed first a fish hatchery uh, because I wanted to learn about the freshwater mussels, which I had done a lot of research, reading a lot of scientific reports, which are so dry, but that's kind of (laughs) what you can get online. So read a whole bunch of scientific reports, learned about the plight of the freshwater mussels and how there's like been huge die offs um, in recent years, um, particularly related to wastewater from fracking going into the river. Um, And so I blanket emailed this fish hatchery. They hooked me up with the US Wildlife Service. And then they ended up taking me out on the river for a day to collect mussels and just kind of learn and be there and just like experience it firsthand, which is really, really important to me. So all my work, even though it's kind of meticulously researched through scientific reports and and you know like data sets or whatever um it's still really important to me that a direct experience that's really personal in usually a natural landscape kind of incites the inspiration so we collected a ton of mussels um and like the the shells shells left over we didn't collect any live ones obviously um but I learned so much in like a short amount of time and then visited some of those oil and gas sites and then actually went out on the river a second time with a different agency, um, Three Rivers Watch, that monitors industrial activity along the river, much closer to Pittsburgh. So um, they'll go to sites where 
that you know might have been an industrial waste dump that the company that runs it is still trying to clean it up. So they'll do like third party water testing to make sure nothing gross is going into the river. Mm -hmm. Um, and then send that off to a lab and then kind of try and send send that to the right EPA agency that can do something about it if there's gross things going into the river. And there's a lot of gross things going into that river. It's yeah. pretty crazy. <laughs> it is wild <laughs> what is going into the water. I'm sure yeah. it's much better than it used to be, but it is still, it's a battle. And yeah. um, what I learned about the every time it rains in Pittsburgh, if it's over a tenth of an inch of rain, sewage goes directly into the river. Oh um, God! Because the, the, <laughs> the, the sewage plants aren't really set up. They're not. Their infrastructure isn't quite robust enough for what what they need to deal with. So it's it's still a battle for sure. She says yeah, safely from kayak. California. <laughs> 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 yeah. I was going to say, I used to kayak over there, and the first time that I did a tour of that facility and learned that, I was like, oh, I think I'm going to kayak somewhere else now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, there's a woman who swims in the river, and she just um, calculates and makes sure it's not right after it rained, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. Is this your first, well, pardon the pun, deep dive into the scientific, the scientific nature of, like, water and rivers and all of that business? Um. <clears throat> That's a great question. No, I'm uh, an underlying theme in a lot of my work has to do with water. I'm not exactly sure why, but that just tends to be something I'm really fo focused on. I think it's because it's life and it moves. I was just gonna say that. <laughs> it moves Earth, and mm. like water is this amazing material that levels everything and is responsible for both these massive, you know, like the Grand Canyon scale, geologic time scales of like earth formations, but also just like simple things. And we, you know, it's such a fascinating system. So I've, I've done some other work looking at how rivers, you know, change their path over time. I've done work with tide, tide charts from the ocean to see those oh, cyclic wow. patterns. Um, and, um, also looking into more like where the human element comes in. So consumption statistics for what we use water for, you know, over long periods of time. Wow. So water tends to be a, a unifying theme. So that's kind of when I propose the idea of looking at the Allegheny. It's only, um, I don't know, like 500 feet from the gallery. So it kind of made <laughs> sense. Um, and from the gallery, you can walk down and get to the edge of it. It's kind of, it's one of the sewage outpour locations, so it's not a great, <laughs> great place to go to, but it is, you can get right on the water and it's actually quite beautiful in its own sublime kind of post-apocalyptic way. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. I'm, yeah. I'm saying this with us. <laughs> had a really wonderful time exploring and learning about all of this stuff and I think that's why art is such a Pittsburgh, wonderful Pittsburgh your post apocalyptic getaway <laughs> <laughs> like art can just let us like approach these complex things that are the reality of you know society in an, in a, from a new format and the work that we made for the gallery that is in response to that is quite beautiful in its own way um, so it's a paradox, but I think there's a lot of really rich um, conversations and discussions to be had around how beauty is created from kind of darkness and how art um, plays a role in that. Yeah, and so maybe we can talk a little bit about the specific work because it, it is really quite beautiful, um, not just because of the collaboration, but just aesthetically. It, the work is gorgeous. and what most people have really been responding to it's it really resonates with me as well that like it's lit in a way that it mimics like the ripples of water through the glass onto the pedestals as well as um it's just like i mean it looks like the muscles in many ways like the work is really iterative iterative of everything that you're saying um even to the point that some people note it almost looks like you're looking through a microscope 
at oh. specimens the way that it the lights again are placed so um let's let's talk about the work for a second so in the collaboration of the three of you um you know dan has brought a lot to the organization in his spirit and he's a basket maker as you mentioned and then Julian is an incredible glass blower. So what did the three of you actually, like how did that come to be? Like what did Dan do in the process? What did Julian do? What, what is the work for people that can't see it? Yeah, um, so one of my first field trips as well, the first week was to go to Dan's farm, which is about 40 minutes drive up river and um, see his process which was amazing. I know you've been there. That place is amazing. Yes. Um, and uh, just talked, I guess I just had really open conversations with both of them about what kind of work they would want to do. And they were both um, really open to just me kind of like directing <laughs> what I see fits best. I think both Dan definitely identifies more as like a, a functional crafts person primarily and Julian as well is actually more of a production glass blower <clears throat> primarily making functional work um, a lot of decanters and barware so um, I was sort of like the artist doing something more conceptual and almost not using them as tools but like putting together, formulating like a way that we could all work together, which happened very organically. Um, I did a, a day in a glass blowing facility with Julian as well. And um, Dan had pre-woven some forms uh, based on conversations. We had about a, a phone call once per month leading up to me being in Pittsburgh, just talking about every like life craft baskets weaving methods um and that that kind of had incited him to to try some new patterns and forms so i took um, some of those samples uh to the glass blowing shop and we just talking to julian about what kinds of forms glass can be blown blown into to pick up the texture um, and the shape and kind of the glass blowing process. Um, and we kind of just came up with this idea of using Dan's baskets as the molds for the glass pieces, um, which we didn't know exactly if it would work. You know, the willow is an organic material. The glass is molten hot. It burns and, you know, we didn't know if they would survive. Um, usually glass blowing molds are cast in bronze. Um, so they, they have different heat properties. So we just did some tests and tried out, you know, to see what would happen. And then like any craft process, it's, you try something, you look at what the results were, you refine, you shift, you try something a little bit different, see what happens next. Then we added color, see what happens next, you know, um, and then the, the side the side of that is we also incorporated some industrial materials into the glass blown pieces, which we can save and or I can talk about now either way. But um, to finish out the idea of the collaboration, it was just very organic. And uh, we partnered with the Pittsburgh Glass Center to do some of the bigger kind of works towards the end. Um, once we had kind of figured out a process that was working, some of them are very more functionally looking and some of them are much more sculptural. The colors we chose were all responding to the colors that show up in the mussel shells. Um, and then Julian was really, really adamant that we, um, and I, I feel like this is one of the best properties of glass as well, the optics, like the way that light shines and magnifies through glass can be just so incredible. And I think that's what reads through when you have some areas of color and some areas of texture from the baskets. Um, that's what ends up making these objects so luscious in a way, and also like carrying some of the textures and colors that the muscles have. So I hope that the people who see the work on you know the in the show just get a sense of the inspiration without being told what it's about 
And then, you know, when they hear the description from who is ever walking them through the gallery, or if they read the description from the label, then it layers the kind of background information and it adds more meaning to what it is that they're experiencing. So it's really important to me the work stand on their own um, and invite people in as just objects in and of themselves. And I think that's where beauty can play a really important role, even though it sort of has a bad word in the quote unquote fine art world. Um, I think that that's an important part of the work that then you learn more about what it's about and then it starts to bridge those, those uh, disciplines between science and art and craft and technology, you know, like all of these things come together and they're embodied in an object that's sitting in front of you and people can connect across those things. Yeah, I mean, um, I would say, I think it's successful in that glass in general, at least that I have seen in our space, um, you know, it's kind of, it has the sexy factor. People are often drawn to glass more quickly than other things or drawn into glass, maybe I should say. Um, but this work has a sculptural element about it. Like it's not, you're straightforward functional, nor is it, you know, a vase or like, it, it's sculptural. I think it is doing what you would intend, especially with the specimens that are kind of also represented or dance basket pieces. Yeah, because we have to mention the baskets that we use to blow the molds, like as molds are in the installation next to the glass pieces. So like you can see the inversion the connection. Yeah. Yeah. But so I mean, was there a lot of tweaking that? Sorry, oh, was, was there a lot of tweaking that you had to do in order to make sure that the the willow survived in the in the mold process? The only thing we had to do was um, soak it in a like bucket of water oh. <laughs> before <laughs> before we blew into them. And the first time you like touch the mold glass to the willow, it would like smoke a whole bunch. And then once it was a charred surface, it kind of just survived. You know, oh. it was like we used we used some of those molds like ten times. Oh like, wow! Yeah. And this is why craft lasts for centuries. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I'm curious though, Adrian. So you know, we've talked a lot about how your work is rooted in science. Um, what what came first for you, science or art? Oh, definitely art. I have a degree in furniture design, so I came from a fabrication background. I love materials. I love the relationship of objects to the body. Um, I don't have loyalty to function. I'm so much more interested in how we feel about and how we interact with objects, not just like, what does it do for me? Um, and that's where the science kind of came, got tied in. I, I really am fascinated with these massive forces in nature that are all around us, but that we sometimes forget about because we're so busy with our day-to-day -day lives. And um, so the first kind of scientific data work I started doing while I was still in my undergrad degree was all about tide charts and looking at the patterns of the tides. Um, and so just a way, like when the world just feels crazy, a way to tap into something that feels grounding um, in nature and just comforting and trying to represent these ephemeral, temporal, cyclic changes that happen, but in an object that you can approach with your body and in familiar kind of materials and that you can take in in your own time and your own space by walking around them. And also in some cases, like, especially with like the baskets, they have a smell to them. The willow itself has a beautiful smell, but when they get burned, they have another smell. So that almost becomes part of the installation as well. So it's not just you're looking at it with your eyes, you're moving around the objects in space. They're being interacted with light um, and you get that sensory input of like the materiality of those objects. And I like playing with all of those things as like the tools for experience, because experience is really what I'm interested in to connect with people through an object. Are there particular materials that you that you like to work with more than others, or do you, do you just kind of like go through the gamut? <laughs> <laughs> my my home base is definitely a wood shop. 
Um, and I've always worked out of a wood shop and I love shops because they're just such a great space to work in. There's tools, you can make anything you need. Usually people are all working for themselves. It's a great community overall as like a way to spend your day. But I definitely jump around and that's where I love the collaborations. So working with Julian who has 20 plus years experience as a glass blower is the only reason we were able to make <laughs> work in three weeks because he, yeah. he knows what he's doing. Um, and and being able to work with Dan, who's spent five years, you know, building up a farm to grow his own willow and has an immense amount of knowledge in terms of just making his, growing his material. Um, and it was really important to me to work with someone who is working with local material and a sustainable practice of material, because when you talk about climate change, that's a huge factor. We got to stop ordering shit on right. Amazon if we want, you know, like if we want to really talk about like the planet's sustainability for the future. So someone like Dan is just an, a phenomenal example of someone who's really dedicated their lives to to that. And I wanted that to be part of the conversation. So um, that's where the collaborations really come in, in terms of, of of I, there's no way I will ever have enough expertise to work with all the different materials I would want to make work with. So I need to partner. And though that collective action is super important, um, not just for me making work, but for all of us, like talking about what are we going to do about like the state of the planet. Uh, it's got to come from a lot of people working together. So in a, in a weird, like small study case study that's what yeah. i tried to do with this project and it just it was so wonderful yeah it seems like you guys ended up with like really great synergy uh together and um like you know just not knowing these either one of these individuals beforehand and then you both you all just come together to create these beautiful pieces of of art and craft like that's that's a great that's it's very, uh, it's kismet, I guess, is what, what one could call it. Yeah, and then, I mean, Rachel, I have to thank you, too, because you guys really supported this whole project. I, like, had vague ideas of what I was going to do and was just like, what do you guys think? And they supported me, like, unconditionally and gave me a place to live and, like, helped facilitate the project. So you, you guys did just a wonderful job of, like, helping without getting in the way or, like, asking me to do a bunch of like work to prove <laughs> what I was going to do was going to work because I didn't know. I mean, the the last three pieces we added to the show, we finished the day before <laughs> the show opened. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I appreciate that. We are a little different, I think. We're kind of like, we're just about making space for people without the expectation of what comes at the end and just trusting that something is going to come at the end and we're all going to learn from it one way or another so thank you for doing that with us <laughs> yeah i think it's really important to work that way you can't plan for everything that experimentation and that like unknown is is like even if it fails you learn a yeah. lot yeah and speaking of that like what's something i'm i know you learned a lot and experienced a lot during your residency um with contemporary craft but like what's something that you walked away with and was just like yeah like that this is what that experience was about. Um, I think it's not even that I walked away. I loved that after I left Pittsburgh, like I've stayed in contact with Dan and Julian and um, Julian's now making more work that I believe he's selling in the gallery. I think it's coming this morning. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, that's kind of a different iteration or like a build off of some of the experimentation oh, we cool. did. Yeah, which is super cool. And um, Dan as well, uh, I recommended that he teach a workshop <laughs> I, uh, at a, an art center I was teaching at this summer in Colorado. And so he texted me, I think, two or three days after I left Pittsburgh and was like, I'm going to be teaching a workshop. And I was like, amazing. <laughs> That's great. Um, so yeah, like just seeing how that kept keeps building after, like that. it isn't just limited to the three weeks we all work together. I, I want to, I like to see things keep growing and I hope both of them like got just as much from the experience as I did for sure. 
Sounds like it. So I'm going to go a little bit outside of the realm of something we normally talk about because, um, well, it serves a bit of personal interest. Uh, <laughs> I am keenly interested in somewhat involved in like the sphere of public art. And I know that you also make work in the public realm. And so I wondered if we can just go there for a minute and talk about how that work either supports what you do in the gallery or is an entirely different you know, way of working for you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, right, art can exist in so many different realms. And what's interesting, especially after being, you know, living through the last few years of like COVID or whatever is um, as an artist, you needed to be able to pivot <laughs> pretty strongly. And I had already been working a bit in larger public works previous to COVID, but when COVID happened, all residency shut down and all exhibitions stopped. And so uh, I was super lucky to have been selected for two public art projects right at the beginning. And public arts time frame is much longer than this, this particular pandemic. So it just worked out that I was able to sustain myself and learn a whole new skill set. Um, <laughs> uh, by doing um, larger works out in the public for um, a part of the 1% for the arts program here in California. Um, I don't know if you could, do you guys have that in Pittsburgh? We do, arguably, yes. yes. Um, yeah. It's a sordid history, but I believe it has made a comeback. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, shout out to the Office for Public Art That's here in right. Pittsburgh. <laughs> that yeah. I used to work for and Rachel worked closely with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and I'd love to know more about the backside of it cuz as an artist, it's it's a tricky process. I believe like um absolutely to answer your question, the work in the gallery is necessary cuz that experimentation and trying to push into working in new ways and partnering and communicating with different fabricators like I've done a couple projects um like the short story is that like using wood as an exterior permanent artwork is a tricky um, thing yeah. to do. So oftentimes with public art, the, the constraints on a project are, is it going to last for, usually they want 50 years, which is a lot. Yeah. And if it's in an outdoor location, potentially near the ocean, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, constraints on public art that do not exist when you're making studio art um, for a gallery. Um, so, and also then when you get into a larger scale, you end up needing to work with structural engineers. And, um, so some of the works I've done so are involve a lot of, um, very close partnerships with fabrication companies that can achieve materials and scales of work that I cannot do myself. Not every artist working in the public realm works that way, but that's how I've been able to do it. And that has been really successful for me in the few projects I've done. But um, the takeaway is that as an artist, you become more of a project manager and mm -hmm. the creative part happens, that research, kind of the residency kind of experience is the just in the proposal phase, which is usually like maybe two months. And then everything after that, which is potentially as long as five to 10 years to see the project through is all just implementation and making sure everyone does what they say they're going to do. Um, yeah, I actually so I I teach public <laughs> art, which is why I was really excited whenever we, you know, chose to work with you and curate into this exhibition and saw like how much you do in the public realm. And I feel like I asked that question because I kind of like in the experience of your residency and the way that you collaborated, it's almost like you have, you've really honed in on the skills uh, that it takes in order to be successful mm -hmm. in public art, but you've brought them into the gallery in a way that I think craft lends itself a little bit different than some of the other fine arts just because like all the things you're talking about the fabrication uh the installation the camaraderie the kinship that is built these two materials to me like 
they could be in marriage in a way, or these two sectors, I should say, um, but I feel it gets overlooked sometimes. So I really appreciate having someone in our space who is, you know, identifies as working in craft, but also identifies as working in the public realm. So it's just, it was exciting oh, I never for me. It that way. <laughs> That's super cool that you mentioned that. Yeah. It was sort of just a squished down version. So. <laughs> yeah. Very, very <laughs> condensed timeline. But um, so do yeah. you have mentors um, in either or both of those fields? Though I've definitely had mentors throughout my career. Actually, how I originally met Julian, the glassblower, was at Penland Center for the Arts, and it was one of my mentors that invited me to be the assistant for her class. Um, and Julian was there at the same time, um, so we became friends and hadn't really stayed much in contact since then. But um, yeah, I've had mentors over the years more in the realm of furniture. Getting into public art, um, is like I mentioned a whole nother skill set and there's people there wasn't anyone in particular that I like it's weird you it's hard to find people who will kind of take you under your wing and walk you through that process um it's a hard process I have had <laughs> I have had someone from an arts commissioning agency lit like word for word describe it as a soul sucking process um, so. it's tough it is tough it's rewarding but it's tough it is well if if you want to get your work out to the public no one has to pay an admission fee like they could right. just happen upon it it's like for everyone that also becomes an issue when they start talking about, well, what about skateboarders and vandalism? Right. You know, like my belief is like, let the public have agency over their space. And why are we trying to preserve something that, you know, might be underwater in 50 years anyways? Like, <laughs> let it be what it's going to be. Nature changes. That's the nature of life. Like, but from the public art perspective, they want to make sure it's not going to hurt anybody and that they don't have to spend a ton of money maintaining it. So there's, there's right. like just a lot more constraints Politics. and polls and polls. <laughs> yeah, there's always that too. Yeah. So that part is a, a little, little tricky, but I do love that it's just accessible to anyone. That's really important. And I love that you guys, Rachel, you put on the no admission fee because a lot of people who aren't familiar with art spaces, and this is kind of just in America, to go to an art museum sometimes costs $40. Yeah. That is not yeah. accessible. <laughs> right. It's like, wild. I mean, even like 20. I mean, it's it's crazy. Art when should I, be free. I moved here from, I'm from Toledo, Ohio, and our art museum is arguably, and I'm pretty sure it's made it on the list as like one of the best art museums in the country. And it's free to go into. And then I moved here and there was like an admission fee at the museums. I was like, ah, what? I was offended by the fact that I had to pay it's, to go yeah. see art. It's not, and it's part of it is just because arts funding is so bad in this country. And mm. I was living in the UK for a fellowship a couple of years ago, and almost every museum is free. Like, oh. you might pay for a special exhibition at like the British Museum, but otherwise no oh. admission fees anywhere. And that's just because the government sub supports the, the arts right. and, you know, education. Um, and we don't have that. So I understand why the MoMA is like, we got to charge $40, but. Uh, it's also like, I mean, do you though? Like, it's, it hurts. Like, it's like, I know you gotta, but do you gotta? <laughs> Could there be another way? Yeah. Well, when was it that you accepted that you're an artist? Oh gosh. Uh, that's an interesting term. I mean, I went to art school when I was 18. I knew I didn't want to do the normal thing early on. I worked at a sports bar when I was in high school and all the girls I worked with had gone to CU Boulder, which is where I grew up, um, for like science and math and all these like oh, wow. quote unquote legitimate degrees. <laughs> And all of them were working at a sports bar because that's how they could make a better living. So right. this taught me a really great lesson. Like, oh, if I'm going to just like have to make money at, you know, a restaurant gig, I'm going to study whatever the hell I want to study. Seriously. So 
I went to art school. My parents were pretty supportive of that. And, um, you know, furniture design just fit for me because it wasn't fine art and it wasn't design. I had full autonomy to do whatever I wanted. And that was like perfect for me. So um, I guess it just kind of always worked for me to do that. I don't know if I ever had a moment of like, aha, I'm an artist. (laughs) No. (laughs) Well, you never questioned it though either. Like there wasn't this moment of uh, or like this, I mean, maybe there are moments of self-doubt because we all get that. Oh, I question it every three months. I go through an existential (laughs) crisis of what am I doing with my life? Amen, sister. (laughs) (laughs) That's my cycle. Uh, That's across the board, yeah. (laughs) And then I'm like, okay, okay, just carry forward and like I hope it works out and it works out. And I've always thought if shit doesn't work out, I will... I'll get a job and I'll be like, at least I tried and I did right. what I believed in. And like, it's, an, I didn't choose the system where we got to make money to survive, <laughs> but we all got to do that. And so like, I just, I feel insanely lucky, lucky that art has worked out so far, but I know it's really hard to do. Yeah. And you do have to like hustle and be on your toes and pivot and like, diversify your income stream and just make it work. It's not for everyone. Right. It's not for the faint at heart, but um, it's wild. It's It's worth it. It's worth it. Like I care about what I do and I love what I do and I get to work with awesome people like you and my class, like Julian and Dan and like get to travel for fun projects and like have these amazing experiences, you know, that's, that's worth it to me. Absolutely. Was there, um, what, yeah, I wanted to ask, what was it about the call for this residency that made you want to apply? Well, um, it didn't actually happen in that order. I was invited to be in the show and then I wanted to do something site specific and then the gallery, you guys at Contemporary Craft were like, why don't you just come for a residency? And so then I applied for the residency to make the work for the show. It was sort of, it actually worked out perfectly, kind of fit hand in hand. Um, Rachel, the residency program, is it relatively new or? Yeah, so we've had a regional residency. We're in our second year of a regional program, but we are in our first year of a national residency program. Um, So it is it is as an open call, but because we did curate Adrian into the exhibition, um, we, yeah, we felt like we should open up the opportunity. There was room in the house because right. um, we have a house up in the Sand Heights that it was like, there's no reason to not add somebody by our own kind of curation outside of the open call. Cool. So. Yeah, and as far as residencies go, I've done a, a ton of them. It was is a really great, great overall experience. You know, the house is really nice and clean <laughs> um, important and let's hope it stays that way first year it is like it is very clean yeah <laughs> but pittsburgh's a fantastic city i've done residencies in some cities where i'm like i can do this for this amount of time but i'm really looking forward to go home and um sometimes it has to do with like the food isn't so fresh Mm. or, you know, like you just don't have your normal comforts or like a place to swim if you're a swimmer, whatever it is. And Pittsburgh just had so much to offer and was just a really interesting city. And people are very warm overall. Like, um, yeah, there've been places I've lived where you like say hi to the person you park next to at the condo and they look at you like you're crazy, (laughs) you know, like, like there's there's definitely a culture to different cities and Pittsburgh has a great culture so it's it was- it's that post post apocalyptic uh, <laughs> welcoming vibe that we have exactly it's, it is- I was <laughs> only talking about the river in that <laughs> but I guess it, it was it is kind of it is different I don't know what it is exactly but again like when I moved here twenty some odd years ago people I noticed di- immediately that people speak to you on the street they say hi and they wave and that you know that you don't know and i'm just i was like huh i was <laughs> i was really taken aback because that's not what i was used to where did um, you move from toledo ohio oh and right okay not, yeah, yeah. yeah and it's not like yeah i mean i don't know it's it's, it's toledo whatever but um yeah 
<laughs> so any hoozles, let's move on to um, the big old musical question. Adrian, would you like to share with us the three songs that describe your work? Yeah, okay, I can answer this awkward <laughs> question. <laughs> I've done my research. Um, <laughs> I have a few options. Part of it, I and I'd love to ask you guys how you for, came up with this question after I maybe answer one of them. Um, the first one I'm going to go with is uh, sort of tongue-in-cheek, but it's going to be Prototype by Outcast. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I love right. Outcast, and yes. I make a lot of prototypes, and it's a really beautiful song. Spot on. Spot on. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the other one is more of a plug because there's this band that's that's kind of up and coming that I'm really into okay. called These Sacred Souls. They're out of San Diego and they're on Daptones, who um, promoted Sharon Jones and the Daptones oh, okay. until nice. she passed. So really great band. And they have a song called Easier Said Than Done, mm. <laughs> which is also sort of a play on words, but is also a really um, beautiful song. And they're going to take over the world. So try and see them before their tickets <laughs> get insanely expensive. I love that, finding that. And, you know, it hasn't happened to me since, like, the 90s. But, you know, discovering those new bands that you really love and then you get to see them at, like, a really small, tight, 21 and over club <laughs> yeah yeah those intimate shows that's uh i miss that for, for ten dollars size yeah small <laughs> venue really right up in front that's what you right. want um uh and then the last one is sort of i have like five different options there um <laughs> well, we'll, we'll we'll be generous and let you break it give me two Oh, uh -uh. <laughs> we'll just do one. We'll just do one. Um, it, I wouldn't say this is like my like favorite um, band or song or anything, but there's an album by Boombox that I've because um, I think I listen to a lot of music or even audiobooks when I'm making my work because a lot of my work is like carved wood which takes hours with really loud machines and a lot right. of dust and so um it's very strange because um i've been learning a lot about memory and sometimes the physical activity i'm doing while i'm making something becomes mm -hmm. encoded to what i'm listening to yeah so like oh, sometimes yeah. i'll carve a sculpture and listen to like there was one sculpture i carved and i listened to the entire diaries of anais nin um, which are fantastic. And that sculpture now is encoded with that, like, experience of listening to her diaries. Um, yeah, I have those experiences, too. Like, I have to be really careful about some things, that I, <laughs> like what I listen to when I'm doing certain things. It's like, I really don't want this memory attached to this song, so let's... <laughs> right. Yeah, you, you get it. I think those things are fascinating. It's almost like synesthesia in a way, or like mm. embodied knowledge. But um, there's one album by Boombox called Stereo that for, I don't know, maybe 15 years has been, like a go-to that I listen to around three o'clock when I'm in a slump and just need nice. to push through until like 4.30. Um, and it's like a short, mostly instrumental kind of like housey background okay. music. But uh, because I've listened to that a lot while working, I'm going to put yeah. that one in there too. So the whole album? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's one of those ones where just every them. song, long it them. becomes one big long song because they don't gotcha. stop between. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So because what we do is we we have um, uh, from the, the answers from all of our guests to this question, we've made a playlist on Spotify that corresponds with um, all of everybody, everybody's favorites. And Amazing. To answer your question as to where this question came from, um, I have a separate podcast. Well, it's on hiatus right now, but it's called The Rugged Angel Cast, where I talk to women and interview a different woman every episode. And um, Rachel was a guest on once. And uh, that was one of my questions. I would, because I was also, it corresponded, at the time, it corresponded with um, a radio show as well. 
And so I would play those songs too. And then it just kind of like when I stopped doing the radio show and it just kind of spilled over because I like the question. I like, awesome. I like knowing people's musical tastes. <laughs> I do love music. And I do, now that you say that, I'm like, when I, when you asked the question, I was like, oh, I need to, like, I don't want to put all male bands. In right. It. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I did. So if you'll let me have the fourth one, I'm going to put in yeah. Lottery by Kali Uchis because I love Kali Uchis. And she's one that I missed the bag because now her tickets are like $300. And Holy I can't cats. afford that. <laughs> wow. yeah. um, but, and she used to be more of like a video artist and became like oh, cool. a musician. And is she sings in both Spanish and English. And it's nice. like banger like music. So I'll have to, I'll have to give her a listen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she's she's blown up. I think she just played Coachella this year, so she's Oh, wow. Like, yep. Yep. One set. I think we're just going up and up and up after this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. So great to hear about your other podcasts, and I'm excited to listen to this playlist after yes. we get off. Well, yeah, we will, I will, we'll send that to you, send you the link. Um, so thank you, Adrian, for, yeah, for you, Adrian. sharing with us. This it's was really... It was yeah, it was it's great and um, very fascinating and uh, educational. I learned learned some stuff today I did not know about a lot a lot of it about the water quality. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think about it too much. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> but um, where can people find you online if you know you want them to? Yeah, I'm I'm pretty simple. I sometimes post to Instagram and it's all, it's just my name, Adrian Siegel and the same for my website, Adrian Siegel. And anyone who has questions, feel free to reach out. I'm awesome. very usually responsive within a couple weeks. And this exhibit is going on until January, 2024, Rachel? The very end of January, yeah. All right, cool. So if you are in the area at that time, come and check it out, Contemporary Craft and uh, Check out the Climate Awakening, Crafting a Sustainable Future exhibit. Sounds from the Studio is produced by Rugged Angel Productions for Contemporary Craft. Hosted by Rachel Rierick and Camila Adams with production support by Mandy Wilson. Please subscribe to and rate the show wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to share. Thanks for listening. <laughs>